Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. And this week, we'll be looking at a variety of projects. Uh, it's things like, does Doom run on an ESP32? I mean, of, of course it does. Uh, also, the prize winners from the Electromaker of the Month competition who won cold, hard cash just by putting their projects on Electromaker. We'll also be looking at the MQTT Anywhere kit, a really interesting hardware and software combination kit for IoT that both me and our in-house gadget guru, Robin Mitchell, have been doing work on recently. Um, and, oh yes, we'll be looking at a fantastic project using the SenseCap T1000, which we featured on the show a couple of weeks ago. We just talked about the Kickstarter then, but now one of our makers has come up with something absolutely wonderful for it. So we'll be looking at that too, which is quite a lot to get through. So roll the opening music. Now, we're going to start out this week's show by talking about the MQTT Anywhere kit. Now, this is something that um, I talked about very briefly at the start of last week's show because Robin, our in-house gadget guru, had done an article on it um, and, a, and a fantastic video as well. And we will be talking about that a little bit today. Um, but before we get into that, let's just go cover the absolute basics of what the MQTT Anywhere kit is and why it's something that uh, I went from not really knowing anything about to being quite excited about. Now, the MQTT Anywhere kit is essentially two things. There's a hardware side to it, and there is a software slash service slash GUI side to it too, called ThingStream. And we'll come on to ThingStream in a minute, because it's really quite nice. However, hardware, um, which is also quite nice. Uh, we have a modified Arduino Due baseboard here. The flip and click boards from uh, Microelectronica have the SAM, oh, I've already forgotten the name of it. The SAM... 3x board which is a customized Arduino Due. In fact here's another image of it right here let me get myself out of the way. On one side you have the Atmel 80 SAM 3x8 E chip um, and you also have a, an Arduino Uno shield pinout here but on the back side as you're seeing here you have um, a bunch of different click slots which is useful for the microelectronica click boards and if you're not familiar with those they're basically think Arduino shields but uh, even more I think of a range than Arduino shields at least official range um, and they can do pretty much everything um, and included in this kit is a U-Blox cellular IoT click board here which you can attach aerials to it also comes comes with an MQTT Anywhere SIM card that you slot into this clickboard before you plug it in. It comes with an aerial and it comes with everything you need to get started. So from a hardware perspective, you really can just kind of get this out of the box and get going. In fact, in fact, getting ahead of myself ever so slightly, this is the section in Robin's video um, from zero to IoT hero getting started with the Ublox MQTT Anywhere uh, kit. Um, this is the moment where he shows you the unique redemption code that you type into ThingStream to get started and then basically puts together the entire kit. So SIM card goes into the click board, click board goes onto the flipping click board. Um, and you're more or less ready to go. Then you can plug in the uh, aerial. There's two aerials that come with it. One is the standard aerial like this and one which is a cord aerial, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. You put that all together like that, plug a USB cord into the computer and you are ready to get going. Now, as always, there is a slightly uh, more clear way to get this information, and that is the pair of blog posts that we have about this kit. Um, I published a blog post recently which just goes through the basics of what it is. It's talking about exactly what I'm talking about right now. Um, this hardware sides to it, showing both sides of the flip and click board, um, and also the Ublox board itself as well, um, along with all of the specs that you will need for them. There's also a bunch of other things like how much does this service cost? Um, unlike normal SIM card providers where you have to pay a, pay a certain amount per month or you have to pay a certain amount for a certain amount of data this is just per message so if you're doing something which only sends a message once or twice every month or whatever you're not going to be paying very much for it at all uh, whereas if you want to start with something that might be quite small and then scale it into a massive IoT project with thousands of nodes all over the place you can do that you just have to scale up the amount of messages you send and therefore pay for that and as you can see two dollars per month for 12,000 messages is not particularly much so once you've got the hardware up and running, you're going to want to connect it to something, and that's where ThingStream comes in. Now at this point, I think it is worth mentioning that uh, Robin's video, while it is very specific, talking about power consumption, goes through all of these things in real time. Um, so I will be leaving a link in the description to Robin's uh, article, um, which is from Zero to IoT Hero. As I've mentioned, uh, this video is, uh, it, well, it's an Electromaker Educator video. Robin is thorough, and he tells you everything you need to know. And in this particular instance, um, before getting on to the real nerdy engineer stuff 
about how much power consumption this takes compared to regular HTTP, HTTPS protocol stuff. Um, he goes through the basics of getting it all up and running and does it with a real example, um, which is uh, probably better than what I'm going to do right now. So you have been warned. However, um, the ThingStream dashboard, having messed around with it just a little bit, is something that I think if I was to uh, put a project together, I would really find very useful. And that is because, uh, firstly, getting started with things is incredibly simple. Um, if you head to the downloads and then you look at their communications as a service, you'll find they have an Arduino library and it is an Arduino library. I mean, it's an Arduino doer, the flip and click board essentially, which makes it incredibly easy to program. Um, I know some people aren't so keen with the Arduino IDE, but remember like platform IO is but a few clicks away. Um, it always is. So um, there's that. Um, and while I'm here, I want to maybe quickly go through a few of the things that make this kind of useful. Um, you have a, a floating MQTT listening uh, box here, which basically listens to any MQTT uh, uh, activity coming in from any of your devices. And if you're wondering how you add any of those devices, you can go to communication services under communication things, click add a thing, and then use a code. And as you saw in the video just moments ago of Robin, you have this um, MQTT device and you have this MQTT SIM card. And basically, you just type the code in and you're going. You don't have to do any scanning. You don't have to type in any stuff. It will just know it and it will be there. Um, so uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, again, I, I've written up an entire article on this, and if you would like to know a little bit more about it, you can always go through there, but the flows are something that I find particularly nice. So you have your MQTT device. It is sending data from the device up to here. Um, you've created topics. Uh, my topics are very interesting, if I can find them. Other, this, this, and that are my MQTT topics. Um, so anything going to those topics goes there, and once you've got the, that information, you might want to do multiple things with it. Um, so, of course, things can subscribe to topics as normal with any other MQTT setup if you've ever worked with it before. Um, but the flows are really interesting. So this is one of the example flows that they just uh, have as, uh, as well, as, as an example, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and so let me get out of the way just here. Although I realized I had changed the example flow, so it didn't make sense anymore, so I've had to revert it. Um, but yes, um, this flow, uh, and indeed this screen, should be familiar to anyone who's worked with node-based programming before. This is a primarily visual uh, way of uh, stringing things together, and these nodes down the side can do a bunch of different things. Um, so uh, let's just start by actually looking at the thing itself. Uh, all you need to know really about this um, is that the different kinds of nodes uh, can do different kind of things programmatically. Um, so this email and alarm for example, is a switch, um, and I'm slightly in the way here, but you can see um, one of the things, uh, you know, one output is, if it's true, go out of output one, otherwise go out of output two, and you can see there's output one and two just here. Um, and they have a bunch of different things like this. Um, breaking, changing delays for each uh, function. So this is a JavaScript function that has to return something or just JavaScript in general. And this is where it gets really powerful. Uh, each one of these nodes, you can just put your own programming into it. And once you've made those nodes, you can have those custom nodes that other people can use. So if you have people on your team who want to set things up visually, but aren't necessarily programmers, yeah, jobs are good. You can do this. Um, so in this particular example, this is a thing stream, thing stream that is subscribed to an air quality sensor that will send the byte data that comes in uh, into a JSON parser that will turn it into a JavaScript uh, object for you. Nicely, nicely. This function evaluates the CO2 reading. And if I double click on it and make sure I'm not too in the way, uh, again, maybe make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, maybe if I do this. Oh, it appears that's as big as I can actually make the text here. I hope you can see it all right. Essentially, this is a little bit of JavaScript that sets a limit for the acceptable amount of uh, CO2 uh, in PPM. The CO2 PPM limit. I should just read the variable name, shouldn't I? Um, and basically, uh, says here is the reading, and it passes the float, which is from the message payload CO2 PPM. This is, that was nicely put together by this uh, JSON device here, which, as I mentioned before, takes the byte data, turns it into a JSON object, and in here we can use it. Um, and if the CO2 PPM reading is higher than the limit, the alarm sets to true, the alarm flag. Um, now, this goes to two places. The evaluate CO2 reading goes to message, and this is a debugger. So you can see at any time, do you want to debug something? If you click it, you have an activated debug, and it will de every time this is triggered, it will give you a debug message. So this is essentially how you can debug your visual code. Um, this also all gets sent to eval. And if you're wondering what this is, um, well, it just showed you. This is a completely um, wireless way of connecting things. So no matter how far away they are from each other, these things will always talk to each other. 
So from evaluation, it goes to email on alarm. This is just a switch, uh, which is if it is true, um, it will go to one. If it is otherwise, it will go to another. If it is true, if the alarm has been triggered, it goes into this format email JavaScript, which basically says, what is this message? What is the, the what is message.ppm, message.json, message device name, and message two? And these are all variables that are then used by the email domain owner. And it says, uh, yes, this formats an email and sends it your air quality sensor device name, which is the variable we just passed on, um, and things like the full JSON and the PPM level two. So what you're seeing here is essentially an alarm that triggers automatically when the CO2 level reaches a certain height, but one that took remarkably little coding to get going and is easy to understand even for someone who doesn't code. Um, well, someone who doesn't really understand how these systems work. This is something that is teachable, which I thought was really kind of cool. It's not the only uh, product that does this. I mean, you can do MQTT with Node Red, absolutely. But this, yeah, when this the, this part hit me and it kind of made it make sense to me that you get this SIM card, it will send the data securely to your service. It re retains security within the service, and you can do a lot of stuff with it without having to do a massive amount of reinventing the wheel. Um, in terms of the Arduino side of things, as mentioned before, you can just download the uh, the Arduino C library, and there's a bunch of examples there as well. So. I think I have chatted enough about my idea of this, why I, why I think it is cool. Um, you can see here, as I've mentioned, um, I've written up an article on it. Let's move on to the Electromaker Educator article that Robin did. All right, so as I did jump ahead to it a little bit before, you know roughly what is going on here. This is uh, Robin's Electromaker Educator video, which goes into a lot more detail about it than I was able to. I am the enthusiastic uh, dog-like arm of Electromaker, really, at the end of the day. I get very enthusiastic about things. Uh, Robin is an engineer who is definitely capable of enthusiasm, but is far better at passing that enthusiasm and saying it in a way that is easier to understand, hence him having the educator title and being our gadget guru. Now, um, this particular article is really interesting because the focus of it is power consumption, which is a big deal because IoT is, yeah, you need to be low powered and you need your hardware to be as low powered as possible. Uh, so yes, the hardware takes as little power as possible to take over so it can run on battery life forever, but it's not just the hardware itself. The way you program that hardware and the way that you actually communicate using that hardware has a big uh, effect as well. And that's what this article goes on to prove. Um, the basic idea here is that um, if we look, uh, there's a chart down here which explains it really nicely. So um, MQTT in this particular example is the nice little envelope that gets sent for the smallest cost in terms of power, whereas HTTP and HTTPS um, are, are much bigger in terms of power draw. Um, and again, if you want to know this in words that make a lot more sense, you should read Robert's article on it. It really does make a lot more sense. Um, but for this is the key part just here. So uh, consequently, these protocols such as TCP slash IP and HTTP are not designed to minimum connect, minimize connection time or optimize energy usage. Because for the most part, they don't need to. Your computer's plugged into the wall. Most things that use these protocols are not designed to be low power and don't have to think about it. Ublox come up with something really nice for this. MQTT Anywhere uses much less power than HTTPS or HTTP or TCP slash IP. Um, and it does it, as I've previously mentioned, just straight out of the box. Now, by far the most satisfying geeky part of Robin's video is where he breaks out the oscilloscope to look at the difference between the two messages that were sent to ThingStream um, versus, uh, sorry, the message that was sent to ThingStream via an HTTP post. Um, and uh, what you're seeing here are these two things next to each other, but that's not actually the way that it was because the, the message to ThingStream was this much shorter. Um, and again, Robin explains this using much better human English words than I am going to here. Um, but yeah, uh, I really love this approach. I really love the idea of not just looking looking at how easy it is to use something like this, um, but showing you a real software example of how software design choices can really change the way that power consumption works along with hardware. Because we're all used to hearing about how low can something run in terms of hardware without really thinking about the secure process that it connects to. Robin also goes into some great detail as to exactly how the secure uh, process works with the ThingStream, uh, sorry, with the MQTT Anywhere uh, SIM card connecting to ThingStream. Um, and yeah, essentially it says when sending data to the APN, it doesn't require encryption from the device's point of view. It's all done on the SIM. Um, 
I, yeah, my starting point for this was watching Robin's video, and I was somewhat amazed that it was as simple as he made it look. Um, I would be really interested to see what kind of projects other people come up with with this. If it is something you're interested in, uh, in, in getting your hands on one and doing so, please do post it on the Electromaker Projects page. It seems like such a great kit that I'd love to see more people um, getting their hands on them and having a play with them. Um, and uh, yeah, the fact that it's a modified Arduino Due makes it very easy to get started with, and I feel like Ublox and Microelectronica have really come up with a fantastic hardware kit for working with the ThingStream service. And from what I've seen of ThingStream, as I said at the start, Robin's the one that's really got his hands dirty and really messed around with this. I just sort of uh, looked inside it to work out what I would do if I had the hardware to play with. Um, and the other thing that we haven't spoken about at all is the fact that everything I've talked about here, their communication as a service idea, this can also work with location devices as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot more to it than I even have time to chat about right here. In short, um, I, yeah, I really love the the whole theory of this that um, they've already had a, a service which is designed to make it as easy as possible to get up and running with something and now there is a single kit that will allow you to get it out get it on your desk and get going straight away lovely job if you are enjoying the Electromaker show, could you take a moment to check that you are actually subscribed to the Electromaker YouTube channel? Most people who watch YouTube aren't actually subscribed to the channels that they watch, but subscribing to our channel does actually come with the odd benefit here and there. Of course, not only do you get to see um, all of our wonderful videos as they come out, but subscribers to our YouTube channel are open to all of our competitions as well. We give away a surprisingly large amount of stuff for the size of channel that we are, um, and uh, yeah, all of our competitions are only open to people who are actually subscribed to us. Now, um, the subscription button, once you have clicked subscribe, turns into a drop down menu and if you select all from this notification sort of thing it doesn't actually say the words notification unusefully but if you click all here this gives you all notifications from this channel and this will mean inside the browser when you are at the YouTube website only you'll get this notification bell in the top corner and as you can see um, this shows things like I have a new subscriber on this channel which is very weird because this channel doesn't do anything um, and also uh, uh, yeah notifications from all of the Electromaker videos that get uploaded we don't upload a huge amount so you won't be getting too much spam from us. The one other thing that would be useful is if you are enjoying, say, for example, Robin's Seed Studio Zhao video. Whatever video you are watching, if you could also click the like button, that would be great. Because it doesn't just tell us that you like it, it tells YouTube that you like it, and makes it far more likely that they will recommend it to others. However, if you are interested in supporting us in a far more concrete way, there is a way that you can do that. Shopping at the Electromaker store helps us out in a very real way. I mean, it's the only way that this show is financed. Um, we don't run any adverts on YouTube. If you see one, that money certainly isn't coming to us. Uh, this is the MQTT Anywhere kit, by the way, that I talked about in the show just before. It is a fantastic kit, but it's not just things like this that we sell. We sell pretty much everything. Um, we stock things from Raspberry Pi and Arduino, but we also stock things from other providers like Adafruit and SparkFun, um, Nordic Semiconductor and Seed, as you can see. Um, in fact, pretty much everything that we talk about on the show is things that is available to be bought from the store um, and if not there's usually something similar to it um, if you are thinking of starting your next project or wants to try and emulate something that you've seen on the electromaker show uh, our store would be a fantastic place to start because as i say all of that money goes directly into supporting our show speaking of the electromaker show let's get on with it shall we now, up next, it is time to look at our prize-winning projects from Electromaker of the Month from August, something I hoped I could have gotten to a little bit sooner, but as I maybe mentioned in the intro, life has been a little bit wild lately, and for some of it, I just didn't have a voice, which wasn't ideal. Um, but uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, let's just get that out of here straight away, the winner of Electromaker of the Month was Jumpless, who I've already talked about at length on the Electromaker show. Um, so um, if you head to the link in the description uh, for this week's Electromaker of the Month, uh, this, um, this screenshot here, and in fact, if you see anything like this on the Electromaker website, I, I don't know if people are aware of this, anytime you see an image with a YouTube play button on it, this links out directly to YouTube at the time that I'm going to be talking about a certain thing. Um, so it's, it's kind of targeted specifically for, you know, the thing that we're going to be talking about. This is the Jumperless section. Um, if you aren't familiar with Jumperless, I really recommend going and watching the section on this video because firstly it is an amazing idea it is a breadboard that does not require any jumper cables all of the rgb lights you see under here are part of actual analog switching uh, an analog switching pcb so you say okay you want to connect say this this little dot here to this little dot over here um, and it will do it for you well actually no that wouldn't work because that's not how a breadboard works is it <laughs> 
<laughs> but you can make the physical connections and the RGB LEDs behind it will give you information on it. You can measure power at any point on the board. It has, it own, it has its own ADCs and DACs. It's a wonderful project. I've been in touch with the creator who seems just like such a wonderful, passionate maker. And um, without giving too much away, someone will be winning a jumperless at some point on the Electromaker show. Uh, we'll be coming back to that very soon. Um, it is a wonderful project. Now, Unsurprisingly, our judges picked this as the first prize winner for the Electromaker of the Month in August. Um, I I generally don't know exactly what the judges are going to pick. I sometimes have a good idea um, because I'm beginning to see a pattern of what comes back after each month of the kind of things that they like. I don't know. I don't actually know who the judges are, um, <laughs> but I had a feeling that this one would win just because it's such a wonderful idea. So well documented, so passionate. Um, the, the project itself on the Electromaker website, by the way, again, um, you can find uh, each title on an Electromaker of the Month article link links out to the uh, but, uh, project itself and it doesn't just talk about what uh, solderless is and go through the video uh, idea of it talk about the browser based way of working with it um, and uh, right through to things like the uh, design considerations when making the box oh no this is this is just a, a fully fledged tutorial as to how you can make your own jumperless board it just happens to just be in the middle of the project but yeah right down to deciding what, how they were going to make the packaging for the box to make it as nice as possible for people it's just it's a lovely project. So, unsurprisingly, uh, congratulations, Architoithis Flux. You have Flux. You have won uh, the one hundred and fifty dollar cash prize, along with a pile of fun Electromaker swag, like pens, t-shirts, all the cool stuff that we have to give away. Whatever we have in our Electromaker swag pile will be coming to you. Now, uh, the second prize winner this month was Waste Sorting with Tiny ML. This is a really interesting project, and I've seen a few variations on this, but none have been this compact and simple. This is using an ESP32 camera module, which has been uh, trained using an Edge Impulse, I believe an uh, Edge Impulse model, to, rec uh, to recognize different types of waste. The idea being that you could stick one of these next to a bin on a university campus or something like that, um, and with enough time and enough training, uh, you could get uh, enough images just to basically hold up anything in front of it and say where do you put this and in the case of this particular coffee cup sadly it has plastic in it so it would have to go into I don't even know what you would do with this and um, that's probably why I need a machine like this as well uh, this is a project from Aaron Varghese and it is yeah it's just a wonderful proof of concept and it is very well documented as well there is a quick video showing it in action um, and uh, essentially, it just shows the, the thing itself. It shows the OLED display on it, and it shows you can put something underneath it, and it will say, okay, what is this? Ah, okay, this looks like paper. This should go in the paper bin. Ah, this looks like food waste. This should go in the food waste bin. Um, and uh, if you want to know how to do it, well, you have the tutorial right here. So congratulations, Arjun Vahis. You're going to be getting the $100 runner-up prize for the second place of Electromaker of the Month, and of course, a bag of Electromaker swag. Now, in third place, we have a DIY home automation project from Jitin. Now, this uses the Arduino Uno R4 Wi-Fi variant, which is actually, if you think about it, the perfect board for easy home automation projects now, because um, you can program it using the Arduino IDE. It's completely backwards compatible. Um, but because they use that Renesis chip on the Arduino Uno boards, it's 5 volts compliant. So it can work with every Arduino shield that has ever worked before. Now, that, with the addition of the Arduino IoT Cloud, means that you've pretty much got an all-in-one system for or making your own IoT Wi-Fi based devices or Bluetooth, I guess, as well, uh, which you can get with the same um, onboard chip from the, uh, the ES, uh, ESP32S3 mini chip that is onboard the uh, uh, Uno. But yes, as mentioned, a lot of people said, why did you bother with an extra chip when you could just do the ESP32 chip? And they did that in the Nano. The whole idea of this Renesis chip here is that it is 5 volts tolerant. Very important. Now, Jitin went one step further than just using the Arduino Uno Wi-Fi board um, and uh, using the Arduino Uno IoT Cloud. They designed their own shield for the Arduino as well. Yes, the root said Uno Shield exposes a few handy things for home automation, such as places to attach relays to. There's a few powerful MOSFETs on there as well, while still allowing you to um, uh, get uh, access to the digital and analog in pins, digital pins and analog in pins as well. 
If you are interested in finding out more about the shield and how you can create your own shields, by the way, the video that's embedded in this project is amazing. It goes through absolutely everything involved um, with how the project was made and how the circuit was built and then how we uh, got it sent to him, how we got it made by a, a PCB service. I can't remember which one. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really worth watching. In fact, uh, Jason's YouTube channel is, is fantastic. Um, it's called Arduino Projects and Robotics Tutorials Rootsade, and it's just at Rootsade on YouTube. Um, yeah, fantastic projects, deserves uh, your subscription. His RT, Arduino IoT Basics video is especially good if you're interested in how the Arduino IoT cloud works and how you can get started with it. Um, Arduino have done a really good job with that, I feel like. It's something we're going to talk about on a future show. Just everything from the way you connect Arduino boards to it to the code generation, it's it's a pretty good job now um yes so this is the home automation hat and obviously once you've got all this kind of thing set up there's a bunch of different things that you can do with it um you have your user leds on there and i think that's the only thing that the project does is it sort of shows the user leds turning on and off yeah there we go um but of course there's a lot more that you could do with it as well so um this is our third prize winner for electromaker of the month congratulations jitten you'll be winning the 50 dollars cash prize and of course the pile of electromaker swag and if anyone is interested in being a part of this competition the only thing you need to do to be a part of it is to head to our projects hub and click upload your projects. You'll then be prompted to create a free Electromaker account if you haven't already made one. Once you've made your account, you can upload the project to our hub and you can even import them from other websites if you've already posted them elsewhere. But once again, congratulations to our three prize winners for August. I wonder who the winners for September will be. It's only a few days now until we pass all of our September projects over to the judges to see who will win. Recently on the show, we talked about the Seed Studio SenseCap T1000, and that was uh, this, this this Kickstarter. Now, um, Seed Studio, uh, unsurprisingly, were very successful with their Kickstarter. It was funded many times over, um, and this thing will be coming to, well, one will be coming to me very soon, because I did buy one, but a few have already gone out to people who are making projects with them, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, if you missed this, I talked about it in a recent show, but basically this is a, a, a LoRaWAN device with batteries in it. It can send GPS positioning. It has an SOS button on it, and it connects to various different LoRa One networks, including the Things Network and many others. Uh, Helium as well, I believe, is one it connects to. Um, and in, in the uh, in, uh, certainly in the case of the Things Network, I know that they already have um, a template for this device specifically, so it's very easy to get up and running. Uh, so I'll leave a link to that in the description. But what I really want to talk about today is this project from Pradeep. Uh, so Pradeep Logu Nort is the username. Um, they've always done a lot of fantastic projects on the Electromaker website, and it seems that they got one of the early release versions of the SenseCap T. 1000 and have come up with one of the most unique ideas for a lower one project that I've ever seen. So Pradeep lives on a farm, and the issue here is that the sheep roam freely, as it says, in a fenced area. They do return by themselves, but some of them do escape. Now, an escaped sheep is something that you need to be able to find. But even if you do find that sheep, knowing where it was and what it did while it was escaped is important too, because as it mentions here, they often come back with health problems like indigestion and stomach parasites by eating all kinds of terrible stuff. Knowing exactly where they've been will help dis uh, discern exactly what they may have eaten, something very useful to pass on to the vet. Laura Wan is a surprisingly good choice for something like this because if you're in a remote and rural environment you're not necessarily going to be able to be stay, uh, stay connected to Bluetooth or any kind of uh, Wi-Fi network. Even if you did set up your own uh, long-range Wi-Fi network as soon as they wandered out of your range you're done. But the good thing about LoRaWAN is that you can connect to wider network ranges things like in this case the Things Network. Now, the idea behind this project is lovely, of course, but the other thing I really like about it is how well uh, Pradeep has documented um, how easy it is to get started with the sense cap, right? Because um, as I mentioned before, I bought one, I've got one on the way to me. Uh, when it gets to me, I'm very much looking forward to messing around with this. But I wondered how easy would this all be? And it seems like they've made it as, as barrier-free as possible. Um, so um, they have an app uh, which you can download, which is the SenseCap Mate application. With that, you can uh, scan the QR code on the back of your um, device, and it will connect to that device, and then you can start configuring it. Uh, and what he's covering here is how you can configure it to work with um, a... LoRa One network. So you configure it so that it can work with the Things Network. It says the Things Network here. And then you go to the Things Network to actually connect it to your device. Uh, once you're connected to the Things Network, then you can connect to a local node. Um, and you're done, essentially, in terms of that side of it. It does seem to be incredibly easy. I'm looking forward to seeing what that's like in a city environment. Um, 
Now, uh, there is a Kubitro integration with TTN. Uh, I don't know much about Kubitro. I do know it is a cloud IoT platform. I, we talked about one on this week's show as well. This one's a little bit different, but it does seem to be a very nice way of showing your data and keeping your data in check. Um, and uh, again, it's something that showed up enough on the Electromaker Projects page that I feel like we should do a little deep dive into Kubitro itself at some point. I'll have to add that to the list of things. Um, and what you essentially end up with, and his, this is the payoff to all of the setup, is a map which shows you all of the data points connected from the GPS on your LoRa One uh, necklace for your sheep. In this case, the SenseCap T1000. Um, yeah, it's just so nice before I even uh, have a device, before the device is even released, to see such a robust idea for a project come out of it, which looks really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, I highly recommend going and having a read of this. And there's so many aspects of it that I would like to spend a bit more time on. As mentioned, uh, Kubitro itself looks really cool. Um, maybe I will try and come up with a city dweller's version of this. Maybe I'll attach one of these to my bicycle and see if I can track myself around the city using the same tools but I thought it would be something that you would find interesting. Um, if you do, do take a look at the project. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. Let Pradeep know, and we can let them know that we featured it in the show, and they can see that people are appreciating the work that they're putting into their projects. Um, and uh, yeah, as previously mentioned, anyone that puts projects on the site has a chance of winning money uh, from us for doing so. Uh, we have an independ independent panel of judges who decide that. I've talked about this on this week's episode already, I think. The recording of this week's show is somewhat disjointed. Um, but yes, fantastic project, Pradeep, um, and I look forward to seeing what you do next with your Laura One and Kia. The eternal question, can it run Doom, usually has the answer yes, because people have got Doom running on increasingly tinier bits of hardware. So it's absolutely no surprise that someone has got Doom running on the Arduino Nano ESP32. That person is Naveen, who is a name you may recognize. They've put a lot of wonderful projects up on our project hub. But this is a bit different. This is a retro handheld console that plays Doom, um, and it is incredibly easy to put together. But first, yes, Doom! Always more Doom on handhelds, more Doom on microcontrollers. I want Doom to run on my fridge. I'm sure if I had a fridge that had one of those screens in it, you know how you get fridges with screens? Our fridge is just a, an analog fridge, I suppose you'd call it. A, a boring analog fridge. But if I had a digital fridge, I'm sure I could get that screen to run Doom somehow. And I don't know, maybe every time you move the milk, it fires. I, Okay, I got distracted. So as impressive as it is seeing uh, Doom run so well, and by the way, there is a video of this all in action at the end here. Um, if I quickly just show you it in action, you will see that you have a pretty impressive frame rate. Um, if we skip forward to when he's actually playing, um, it is surprisingly good. But that's not the most impressive part of it. The most impressive part of it to me is that this is everything you need to emulate it. Um, breadboard, uh, spy screen, you could use various, I believe this is an Adafruit one, um, and then a thumb joystick here and buttons. It's made it even easier by the fact that they're using, I think, I2C uh, thumb joystick and buttons. Um, and uh, all of the things that you need here, by the way, you can find them here. Oh, these are these are Grove rather than Stemmer, either way. Uh, Adafruit 2.8 uh, TF TFT Touch Shield, um, but rather than using it as a shield on top of an Arduino Uno, they are uh, wiring up the breadboard themselves. It's all very easy to follow, and as with all Naveen projects, it is a really well-documented uh, build here. Um, but yes, uh, the Arduino Nano ESP32 is possibly in, 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 one of the more likely targets for uh, porting Doom, Doom 2 because it's very powerful. But the interesting thing about it as well is that um, I don't know much about the uh, Retro Go framework that they have, um, but I know Retro Go allows you to run Doom, um, but other things as well. So for example, the NES, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, the SNES as well, but it says it's slow, uh, the SG-1000, the Master System, the Mega Drive, Genesis, a bunch of really old ones, and then uh, others Doom, including mods, which is what we're looking at today. But I just thought I'd mention that because while this is definitely Doom on an ESP32, um, this handheld console idea is something that you could take further and port all kinds of different uh, retro games onto. So um, I'm going to leave that there. Uh, if you've seen enough, you've definitely seen enough, and you'll want to head to the link in the description to find out more about it. As always, this is a fantastic project from Naveen. Um, and I, uh, yeah, if you want to follow how to do it, it is, as always, wonderfully documented as well.
I want to very briefly touch on this Tom's Hardware article. I earmarked it a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, 13 days ago, I suppose, um, uh, when I first saw it, because uh, the M2 2230 is from WD, Western Digital, and it is a Western Digital black um, SSD, uh, and it is absolutely tiny. And uh, this is actually aimed more towards the idea of people who buy things like Steam Decks uh, and handheld gaming consoles. I say people who buy. I mean, I would absolutely get one of these <laughs> if, I, uh, uh, if I had the money to spare and the time to use it. I would absolutely have a Steam Deck anyway. Um, the thing about it is it's tiny. It's absolutely tiny. And the first thing I thought when I saw that is that this is so small that you could make a development board, which is one side is just a absolutely tiny M2 keyed slot for this drive. And the other side is whatever microcontroller or system of chip on chip of your choice would be to do whatever you would need that amount of SSD speed for. And I can't even think what that would be. I, I like I, In my mind, I can't think of what you would use that for. But as soon as I saw something that small, it just came to mind and I thought other people might have ideas for it. So I wanted to point this article in the direction of our audience. If you have an idea of what you could do with this absolutely tiny SSD in the context of embedded stuff, let me know. Just before we close out the show this week, I wanted to quickly uh, nip back to the Zima Blade. We talked about it a couple of times. Um, they have smashed their funding goal. They've almost doubled it. They've almost raised $100,000. They wanted $50,000. Um, if this is the first time you're hearing about Zima Blade, we have talked about it a couple of times in previous shows, but essentially this is a single board server, not dissimilar to the original Zima board that they put out a while ago, but it is much more extendable. It is very, very small. Uh, you can put different uh, amounts of RAM in it. And one of the things I found really compelling about it is that it starts at such a cheap price. You can get the basic version of it for just $64, uh, um, and that is the Zima Blade 3760. Um, and if you'd like to know all the different uh, variants of it, um, you can find all of that out on this page that I will link in the description of the video. Um, I just wanted to mention one other thing as well, is that um, once I talked about it, there were a few questions that came through to me about it. Can it do this? Can it do that? I also had one person kind of say, like, what is that naming convention about? And I don't think that they were the only person because, yeah, there's a community fact here. And one of the things the second thing on the fact is like, what is the name about? And it turns out that um, the, we plan to give Zima Board and Zima Blade some interesting engineering code names to differentiate between different specs. We uh, Therefore, we decided to use an octal conversion based on 2032 and 4032, 3760 and 770. However, based on the earliest feedback, we've also recognized that the current naming convention has caused some confusion. <laughs> Anyway, if there's any questions you have about this kit uh, before you back it, or you've maybe backed it and you're interested in finding out more about it, this fact may be interested to you. I will leave a link to it in the description of this video. That has been the Electromaker Show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your continued support. Um, if you found anything from this show particularly interesting, or I said something wrong, or there's more of something you'd like to see on the show, please do just leave a comment on this video. As mentioned earlier in the show as well, all of that YouTube MacGuffinery about making sure you're subscribed and liking the video and turning on notifications and all that kind of stuff makes a big difference. It just makes the show slightly bigger and uh, the chances of me being able to do even more stuff with Electromaker, which of course I would love to do. Um, and yes, uh, as always, if there's stuff that you uh, feel like is underrepresented on the show or overrepresented, do let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to do cover more stuff to do with, for example, 3D printing if people are interested in it. But since we tend to sit more in the embedded uh, area of things, I tend to kind of stick to that kind of stuff. It's the stuff that I'm certainly more interested in personally. Anyway, um, that is it for this week's show. I will be back with you next time. But for now, I hope you have a fun, safe and creative week. Take care.